Hello, everybody, and welcome to what I think is going to be one of the most exciting Facebook Live programs we have ever had. Uh, I think everybody understands that how we learn about the world that we live in is largely through media. And today we have four people with us who are extremely knowledgeable about the changing face of media. And uh, let me introduce them to you now. Their sh Sharma is the senior correspondent with Now This. Mike Van, uh, Van Nisi is uh, the head of editor the editorial board of Attention. Uh, Dina Tapuri uh, is with AJ Plus, and she is the senior presenter there. And Anna Kasparian is the co-host with the Young Turks. Guys, thank you so much Thanks for being us. with us. All right, let me start. I got a million questions. We don't have a lot of time. All right, 20, 30 years ago, uh, people got their information by turning on CBS or NBC or reading the New York Times. The world has changed rapidly. Uh, what is changing? How does this impact young people? How does it impact politics? Where do you think we're going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now? in a rapidly changing uh, media world. Who wants to start off? I'll start. Um, so uh, the media landscape changed uh, very rapidly uh, following the information age. In the 1990s, uh, the internet allowed for uh, independent media and the gatekeepers of information, the major networks, were no longer in power of the narrative of the news and, and what kind of information can get out there. And so that was a very empowering time for people who wanted coverage of issues that weren't getting attention. And I think that it uh, really spoke to younger generations, particularly um, millennials who grew up in the middle of the information age, um, who just had a thirst for something different. and. Um, all of a sudden, you fast forward to recent times, and you have the cord cutters, the people who just completely, uh, completely reject cable news. And they do their research online. They get their news online. What is absolutely astounding to me is that, as I understand it, uh, the median age of a primetime Fox News viewer is 68. CNN's medium primetime viewer is 59. I am assuming that the people who watch uh, your efforts are a little bit younger than yeah. that. Yes, who wants to By speak about to that? 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's like double. Yeah, give or take. Is that right? Yeah. Double what our average yeah. is, yeah. But they're not only younger, they're not tuning into TV to get their news, they're going to their social media feeds, and that's where we exist, right? So what used to be a feed of just selfies and, you know, friends wishing one another happy birthday and stuff became a verified news feed. And so where AJ Plus has thrived, and my colleagues as well, is we presented news from a completely different perspective. I am one of my audience. I am a millennial. Um, AJ Plus, we are very committed to social justice and we will present the news that way and it has resonated with them for that reason. Um, it's also made news very shareable. So, you know, we talk a lot about likes and shares and these type of metrics. Um, ultimately, when you do a story that the mainstream media either won't cover or gives you a completely different perspective, you see it shared and I think that creates resonance. Give me, that's a very, very important point. Give me an example and jump in here as to the kind of issues that you will focus on that CBS or NBC will not? I think, I was going to say the environment for us is, is okay. a huge one. I mean, especially with respect to how it will directly affect people's lives. Um, we've had a ton of success with videos around something like overfishing, which I don't think a lot of people think about, or plastic in the ocean, that you're eating plastic very often when you're eating seafood. So those are the type of stories that I don't think get a lot of attention in a mainstream uh, arena, but when shares become a component of, of what uh, is going to make something uh, go viral, uh, then that sort of changes the dynamics completely. Climate, climate change is a huge issue for our audience as well, and we were shocked when we looked at stats from the 2016 election. We covered this every day. Every single day we're doing videos about the effects, solutions, something related to this topic, and there was a study that said the major networks covered it for a grand total of like 33 minutes in all of 2016. There yeah. was a study that was out there. You know, Sunday news shows plays, plays a role. Uh, and the amount of time that they had devoted to climate change, to getting scientists up there to talk about the issue, was almost unbelievably minuscule. So, all right, so what you're telling me is that the issues that you focus on are issues of concern to younger people that the corporate media often uh, 
does not pay a lot of attention Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Another example, and a very recent example, is what's happening um, with regard to the FCC uh, deregulating uh, these internet service providers and, and doing away with net neutrality. That is something that not just young progressives care about, but right. people across every ideological spectrum um, really feel passionately about because you're uh, essentially doing away with a free and open internet. Okay. Anna yeah. raised a very important issue that I want to get into now. And you're right. Uh, I can tell you the people who are watching this show, who communicate with me all over this country, are deeply concerned about what's going on now with the FCC and their effort to end uh, net neutrality. Uh, a simple question. Uh, if they are successful, and we, I should tell you, are going to fight them as hard as we can in every way that we can, but if they are successful, how does the Internet look differently? Who wants to comment on You that? have giant, profitable corporations becoming the gatekeepers of information. And we're talking about corporations that own media companies themselves and would, of course, want to slow down the websites for their competitors. Why wouldn't they? All right. In English, what does that mean? If I'm just somebody who, you know, you know runs all over the Internet, how does, how does that impact? Wealthy corporations are going to decide what you get to see. Wow. There won't be as much information out there. It's, not, it's no longer democratized, the Internet. And the information that you give and what the public is aware of is no longer the same. It's no longer fair. And it's a big access problem for poorer communities as well because they already, like the Internet is their free information, uh, their public library, essentially. And if you have wealthier corporations charging exorbitant rates for, just for access to some of these people, then we're going to see even more of an information gap just based on class. So at a time of massive media consolidation, mm -hmm. where in terms of mainstream media, you have a relatively small number of media conglomerates controlling what the American people see, hear, and read, where the internet has been a democratic force, where somebody with a small blog can get going, you're a small business, you can get going, right? Mm -hmm. What you're saying now is the big money is going to be able to determined to a large degree what happens on the internet, is that what you're saying? And it is an example of crony capitalism because it uh, does away with competition. Independent media sources are no longer going to have the ability to grow their, their, their companies and, and spread the information that they think is important for people to know about. Um, it, it gets rid of that competition, and ironically, the FCC, uh, Ajit Pai, uh, specifically says, no, doing away with net neutrality increases competition. It is a Lie. It's a lie. Flat lie. There was another um, chairwoman, not chairwoman, but a member, an FCC commissioner, who actually wrote an article for the Los Angeles Times, and she said, stop us. Like, actually reach out, mm -hmm. campaign, send us your messages, and stop us. Because Ajit Pai may be saying one thing, but other FCC commissioners are not in favor of what they're doing. This is a huge issue, is it not? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, I want to, being a United States senator, I want to just mention to our viewers, we are going to do everything every way. Uh, this is so dangerous. The internet has been a way for issues to get out there that the corporate media would not put out for people to communicate with each other, and we cannot allow them to destroy uh, that process. Um, media consolidation uh, in general. Koch brothers are now going to be buying some, getting, uh, becoming a major purchaser of Time Incorporated. Does that concern you? Well, I mean, here's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, we still have uh, a landscape where, you know, if you have a free internet like we were just talking about, it doesn't concern me as much because we've already seen, you know, companies like ours, right? We've been able to outpace the traditional media uh, because we can reach our audiences uh, through other places like social. And no matter what, we're, we're good at that and, and we feel confident in that. So I think consolidation matters to the extent that we still have the ability to reach people. If we still do, um, I think we can apply the best practices that we've done in the past to reach people. I think it's a First Amendment issue, too. If there are fewer media companies out there because they're all owned by a few small, wealthy corporations, there's less news reaching you. There's less diversity. There's less creativity. And it's ultimately going to affect the citizens. So I think it's, I see, totally see it as a free speech uh, First Amendment issue. You know what has always astounded me is how somebody determines what the news of the day is going to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the big media conglomerates. Everybody else, you know, you walk down the lobbies here, what do you think about this? What do you think? It's always the same question because somebody has determined what the key issue. And I've often said this, just as one example, that in all my years in politics, nobody has come up to me and said, Bernie, what are you going to do about poverty in America? 
That question has never been asked. What are you going to do about income and wealth inequality in America? And you can walk with me in a few minutes. There'll be dozens and dozens of media, and they'll come around and you'll ask your question. Nobody will ever ask those questions. All right. How do we, this is, now I'm speaking for myself. I think one of the reasons uh, that Donald Trump was elected president is there are a lot of working class people throughout this country who are really struggling. They're working two or three jobs. Their standard of living is in decline. May not have health care. They're scared to death about what happens to their children who may have a lower standard of living than they have. They turn on the TV. No one's ever talking about their lives. Mm -hmm. Who cares about them? Right. Are we, do we, do you, do I, do we as a people really talk about what is going on in the lives of working class people effectively? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, no, I mean, for, for us, we've seen when, I think there are ways to do it. Um, we don't talk about it enough, and even more than that, I don't think you have uh, people uh, on screen who actually come from a working class background yeah. who understand it. We, we've had actually had success already. We have, we've talked to fast food workers, or we've talked to people who are from towns where a huge factory left, put them on camera, have them talk about it, and it really resonates with their audience because they feel like they're, they're seeing someone who looks like them. It exactly. looks like their cousin. It looks like somebody who's lost a job in their neighborhood. That's one point. One of the videos that we did um, during the election that really spoke volumes to our audience was when one of our reporters went and spoke to an individual who uh, by no means is, is liberal or progressive, uh, but was very rational when it came to uh, uh, some of the promises that Trump made. Uh, he lost his job at, as a coal miner. And he just gets up on camera. He's like, I have no love for TYT, right? He was very honest, and I, I respect that. And he's like, but the reality is these coal jobs are not coming back. Um, and I thought that was such an interesting perspective coming from an individual who's right in the middle of, of this economic um, issue. And I think it is important to give them a voice. And I think corporate media has ignored them for far too long. And I think we as digital media players have to be sensitive to that and very aware of that and not make the same mistakes. Well, they are all, I'm sorry, Jen. I was going to say what I think is also important is not just interviewing these people, but having newsrooms that are representative where you're actually hiring reporters and producers who are from diverse socioeconomic and class backgrounds. And I think that's something all of our newsrooms kind of reflect. We're diverse not just in terms of race and gender and religion, which is so important, but we're also not just hiring Ivy League, masters, educated right. journalism students. We have yeah. to hire storytellers from everywhere. And, and I think you're absolutely correct to say that Donald Trump tapped into that and he appealed to working class people. I mean, I traveled around the country and I talked to some of them who were voting for Donald Trump. Um, and when I said, who would you vote for after him? Oftentimes it was you. Yeah. Um, but what I would also put you know, a, a large amount of blame on is the corporate media and how yeah. his campaign was covered. And you know, he was very strategic in making social media tweeting something crazy and turning that into a mainstream media headline. He got so much free exposure and free. You know crazy. that he's doing What do you think crazy. he's doing yeah. now? It's crazy. Doing Absolutely. Now. But but you have to fault the, you have to fault media for doing that for taking every single tweet and making it a headline, giving him blanket coverage yeah. at the expense of your campaign and real issues that we still well, don't talk would, about. They would cut away from your debate or your town hall and immediately go to Trump's empty podium. Absolutely. And yes. that drove me insane yes. because his empty podium is worthless to an audience that feels distressed with their economic situation. And so now Trump has used that to his advantage where he says that uh, these networks are fake news and people latch onto it. They believe it because they feel neglected by them. The and same networks that facilitated his ascent. Good that's point. right. Yeah. Good point. How do we do better? All right, now let me give you an example. My own view. Well, it's a fact. There are many, many millions of people in this country whose life expectancy now, are you familiar with this, is shorter than their parents. Jeez. Okay, All over the world, and what happens with the improvement in medicine and, medicine and, and, and so forth, people live longer lives. It's going on all over the world. In the United States now, we have many millions of people who, as a result of drugs, mm -hmm. alcohol, suicide, despair are living shorter lives than their parents. Do you think we're capturing that reality in the media? Why is it? Yeah. Why are people turning to drugs to the degree they are, alcohol, suicide? What's going on? Is that pain being reflected in the media? I don't think it's being reflected. And actually, we were talking about earlier issues that we cover that you don't see in the mainstream. One for us that's huge is mental health. 
Um, opioid addiction okay. is, is sort of another corollary to that. Right. We, we've covered right. that a ton. But mental health pieces really resonate with our audience. And again, I think that, I mean, it makes sense, right? If people feel like their, their lives are not going to be as good as uh, they had hoped uh, and they're around that circumstance, like, sure, then mental health content is going to resonate with them. And again, they're probably not going to see that um, in most mainstream outlets. And for the longest time, having um, genuine conversations about mental health was considered taboo. Yes. And, and, I, and I don't think that's true of what you see in digital media. Talking about depression or anxiety um, is, is important, and people do feel like those issues resonate with them. And here's the thing. I, I don't think that a lot of people have the resources necessary to get the treatment for their depression or their anxiety. Um, you know, getting access to a therapist, getting your insurance company to pay for a therapist, yeah. it's impossible in a lot of cases. Yes, yeah. Those are the issues that we really need to focus on and not just bring up when there is a mass shooting right. and people are looking for a scapegoat so we don't talk about gun legislation. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Do we talk about the causes? Why is there so much, how shall we say it, mental illness in this country? Why are people so distressed? What's going on? I mean, the world is changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. The economy is changing very rapidly. Do we capture that in media? How do we do better at I think covering sort of like, I think even like the financial realities. Like again, another one is student debt, right? Yeah, so right. student debt is an issue that is uniquely going to affect people of a certain demographic, uh, particularly young people, right? So covering that issue and, and talking about the really tough choices that people are making, and Good I think enough. that will affect your mental health, right? Like sure. if, if you're if you're paying twice your rent in student lo loan payments every month. Uh, that's going to make a huge impact on how you think about the world. And by the way, you're, you're probably not going to spend a lot of time then, uh, you know, digesting even regular media like you might. And it, it, might, it might make you feel like, hey, I'm not going to even bother voting. I'm not going to bother following anything. Right, absolutely. Like, we've talked so much about Trump voters over the last year, but what about the people that didn't vote? There were well, a lot of people that didn't. But also look at the current politics of the moment that Donald, Donald Trump is perpetuating politics of exclusion, um, Islamophobia, uh, you know, against undocumented people, discrimination. That is affecting the mental health of these communities. I'm a Muslim American. I can tell you that there is a lot of fear and a lot of PTSD. You know, hate crimes are on the rise and stuff. So we all also need to be uh, paying attention to these communities that are, are on the margins, that are experiencing their own issues, that are exacerbated by the That's true, in the but White let me House. tell you what else is true. A uh, number of months ago, I spoke to a therapist in Burlington, Vermont. She said, people are coming in, they're worried, cuts in Medicaid. Mm -hmm. All right, you know what yeah. that means? Yeah. That's what's paying for their treatment. Yeah. If somebody is saying that you may lose the health insurance that you have, which is keeping you alive because you have cancer, you know what? You're going to get pretty anxious about that as well. Mm -hmm. There is an enormous amount of anxiety. I did a, uh, a town meeting a couple of weeks ago in Burlington High School. And what I wanted to get from the kids there, we had the whole school there, is I am worried about this opioid and heroin epidemic. Why do you think it's happening? Why are so many young people drifting into drugs? What can we do about it? And one of the things, the good points they made, is that people, kids, are not talking with each other about the crises they're facing. Everybody thinks that their own family is the only family in America yes. that is dysfunctional. Well, guess what? It ain't. Yeah. All right? You got zillions of families. Every, every family in America has its problem. And the more we talk about that, people say, oh, I thought I was the only family. The better off I think we're going to be in trying to address these crises. Make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, do we do that? Also, going back to the idea of media consolidation, for the most part, one uh, level of news that's done well covering the opioid crisis over the last 10, 15 years has been local news. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, local news budgets have been gutted. They've been consolidated. They're all under Gannett or whatever big corporations. And so the local newspapers and local news outlets that we see still doing a good job covering the opioid crisis in their hometowns, they need to be supported by people. So that's where even the viewers of this live stream can come in handy. If you want to see outlets like ours succeed, you need to engage with the content that we're making, but you also need to be supporting local news and people who are actually reporting on issues that matter to your community. And I also think it's important to really change the narrative of, of the person who does fall victim to drug addiction because for far too long America has 
criminalized them and said a lot of defamatory things about these individuals. Mm -hmm. And now, for the first time, I think that because of the way news is covered online, people are starting to see a completely different perspective. These are not bad people. These are individuals who got addicted because they've fallen on hard times or they have mental health issues that need to be addressed. They need to be rehabilitated. And I think that's also important to discuss. It's, it's really powerful to shift and change that narrative. Especially when there are more jail beds in this country than there are hospital right. beds, mental hospital beds. Right. So often when you see working class people on television, they're either criminals or, you know, uh, being portrayed in a very, very negative light. You really don't see too many people who go to work, raise their families, do well. Work I two think. jobs. Work two or three jobs, that's right. All right, question for you. This is something that concerns me very much. We've got a million problems that we could talk about, income and wealth, inequality, the collapse of the middle class, climate change, racism, sexism, homophobia, we can go on about eight hours. But what I worry about is this country drifting toward an oligarchic form of society, where in terms of power, you see fewer and fewer very, very wealthy people controlling not only the economic and political life of the United States, but of the world itself. I mean, you're looking at, unbelievably, uh, a half a dozen of the wealthiest people in the world owning more wealth than the bottom 50% of the world. In this country, three people now own more wealth than the bottom half of our people. Three people. Crazy. Right. Do we talk about that? What does that mean politically? The Koch brothers will spend many hundreds of millions of dollars electing their friends to Congress, which is why they may be able to pass this disastrous tax bill. Do we talk about that enough? If not, why not? I mean, one thing that we did, again, going back to the 2016 election, but it can teach us something for 2018 and 2020, Every single primary network debate, we were waiting for a question about Citizens United to come up. Mm -hmm. And it never came up. And it's one of the most impactful uh, Supreme Court decisions on our politics. You're absolutely right. For and guess and what? Decades. All right. Why not? Who benefits from Citizens United? Your CBS and your NBC. How are you doing with Citizens United? You, think you, you own a TV station in New Hampshire. You think you're going to be really ranting and raving about no. the power of money in politics, how we have too many TV ads? So, I actually have a, a little bit of a solution to that, um, because these are important issues that don't get brought up enough during primary debates or uh, debates during the general election. Um, these debates need to take place on independent media outlets yes. that want to talk about these issues, yes. because the cable news networks, you know, I get it, they're you know, the traditional uh, lucrative ones that people are used to, but uh, their viewership is down and they're not going to talk about the issues that matter. I think that there needs to be a shift in, the, in where politicians go to get their messages out. You know, mainstream media is not talking about this again, but um, we saw a lot of success when we talked about these issues, especially during the primaries. I'll give you a few examples. Um, I did an explainer on the green screen breaking down what is a rigged economy, viral. We're talking, yeah, viral, millions of views. I'll send it to Armand, he can send it to you. Um, another time, I went to New York. I went to Wall Street. I got access to the New York Stock Exchange floor. And I said, you know, Bernie Sanders has talked a lot about Wall Street, this campaign, and I'm here to find out what does Wall Street think of him. So I walked around Wall Street. I talked to traders, and a lot of them agreed with your ideas. A lot of them were critical of the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington. You will never hear this stuff on mainstream wow. news. But we put these videos out, and I'm talking millions of views. So there is an appetite for this kind of knowledge out there. And our audience, the young millennials, are sharing it. Yeah, I mean, we had a video on gerrymandering that's reached almost 10 million views at this point. And I think there is a hunger for, you know, gerrymandering, I mean, that's, that's one of those words that we throw around. We think everybody knows what that means. But most people don't. But if you, yeah. if you explain it to them in a way that um, it, it's not condescending, it's not dumbing it right, down, right, but it's right. conversational. Um, and I think we actually have to figure out more ways to talk about things like Citizens United and gerrymandering in conversational ways. We have to figure out more ways to talk about democracy. All right, let's not kid ourselves. In 2014, the last midterm election, 36% of the American people voted. Almost two-thirds did not vote. Poor people, by and large, do not vote. How do you bring them into the political process? How do you make politics relevant to their lives? How do you start talking about issues where they're saying, yeah, that's right? There are, I would guess, a majority of people in this country who do not know who the United States congressman is, let alone what party he or she is. Many people don't know which political party controls the Congress. All right, how do we do that? I mean, in a sense, we have to do what should have been done in the third grade, right? Right. Get involved in basic civics. How does a democracy work, et cetera? 
Um, but I think one of the reasons that Trump and his friends are successful is a lot of people just don't know how right. things happen. Yeah, I, I think that we need a comprehensive approach that goes further than media. I, I think that independent media is doing great things, and hopefully we, we will continue to do so. But there has been the dismantling of, of public education for a long time now. And um, as we know, uh, college has become more and more unattainable because of its rising costs. It's outpaced uh, inflation. And so, uh, and now propaganda has really seeped into certain communities where people think being educated is being an elitist. And we need to fight back against that because educating people empowers them to make the right choices for themselves. It gives them the critical thinking skills to vote um, for their best interests. And I think that is one of the reasons why um, some people don't go and vote or they vote against their best interests. They either have been convinced that their vote doesn't matter or they don't, you know, critically think about certain things. Um, and, and that's not to be condescending in any way. I, I want Americans to be part of this democratic process and I want them to fight for their best interests. I think that's so important and I think this is another area where people with platforms like ours can be so helpful, talking about the impact of um, social media and grassroots movements. We did one video about this great organization called Run For Something that's training and inspiring and encouraging young people to run for office. One video goes viral, does millions of views, and within three days, they said that they saw applications increase by 500%. Okay, now, that, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. but that takes me to another issue, uh, <laughs> is that, you know, in um, November 7th, we saw really significant victories, and while the media played up the important victories, gubernatorial victories in New Jersey and Virginia, the really exciting, I think, development was just what you talked about, is a lot of younger people uh, working class people, in many cases, who had never run for office before, started running for state legislature, city council, school board, and by the way, won. One of the great quotes, to my mind, of the election uh, of November 7th was some Republican oper operator in uh, Virginia saying, we lost elections to people we had never even heard of. These were not seasoned political opponents. People just decided to go out and knock on doors, and they ended up winning. What role are you guys playing? And I mean, we've heard one example of yeah. this, and a great example. Yeah. Essentially, you're telling people how they can run for office, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. That is just enormously important. Uh, how do you, and I know the obvious answer to this, but you are all playing a very important role in developing grassroots activism, yes? Yes. Talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, yeah, start off that, yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Nancy. Okay, Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, TYT has launched, because of what happened during this past election, um, TYT has essentially launched um, an advocacy arm of the company. It's separate from the news. Um, and if anyone is involved in the news, they can decide whether or not they do the advocacy. But uh, we've launched Justice Democrats. And the idea behind it is to have real progressives, primary Democrats who are not representing the best interests of progressives. Individuals who might, uh, you know, say that they're liberal or, or believe in certain liberal ideology, but their uh, voting record does not prove that. And I think that it's a really great way to empower young people um, to run for office when they otherwise wouldn't even think to do it, right? Um, and it's to create like a, a, an infrastructure to support them so they uh, will be successful in doing this. Um, so that's what we're doing. Good. I wouldn't say that AJ Plus is engaged in grassroots activism. What we do is, is give the people from the grassroots a platform and amplify their voices, whether we're talking about, you know, I was, in, I was in North Dakota reporting on the Dakota Access Pipeline, and we told the story from the Native American's point of view. My colleagues were just in Alaska, and they told the story of the Native Alaskans. You will never see that on mainstream news. Um, earlier this year in Hawaii, also telling this untold story of um, the pain that a lot of Native Hawaiians have against colonialism. So whether we're talking about the undocumented community, LGBT community, Muslim American community, those that are on the margins and those that are often maligned, especially by this administration, we're going to them and we're telling their stories. And, um, and they're being shared online. And I think that our audience recognizes that we are a source for that and this is where they finally see themselves reflected in the media. And to be able to tell your own story or see your own story told on such a big platform that reaches millions of people, I think is transformative and it's empowering. And this is where young college students, you know, they're beginning to you know, grapple with issues in the world and where they fit into the world and shape their worldview. And I'm personally really proud that we're playing a role in that. And we're being the antidote to mainstream media in a lot of ways. All right, let me ask you this. We're going to 
bring the discussion to a close. What is the media world going to look like 10 years from now? That is a difficult question. <laughs> I know. Let's, let's see how this net neutrality thing uh, plays out. Yeah. So. Um, I think that as long as there is a thirst for information, um, information will prevail. And one of my favorite examples of that is what happens in Cuba with individuals who don't have access to the internet. And, and what young people in Cuba are doing um, in order to share information and Western culture and, with one another. And so, yes, net neutrality is scary, but I think that um, as long as we fight, and again, as long as we empower the American public with as much information as possible to uh, fight back, um, we will succeed. Uh, I think that the gatekeepers, people who want to be gatekeepers will always exist, but we will fight them, um, including you know these conglomerates and, and these corporations. Further thoughts 10 years from now? I'm optimistic. So are I mean, people going to be turning on? Is CBS going to be in existence 10 years from now? More like turning on your computer and going to Netflix yeah. or Hulu. Or well, is, that what, is that what you yeah. think? Well, yeah, absolutely. You'll log into everything, absolutely. But news programming, yeah. those, those yeah. platforms will carry news programming. Oh, yeah. Sooner rather I think, than later. I mean, I'm optimistic that we have already seen that the average citizen has a voice. And because of social media, because they're a broadcaster in their own right, um, are seen as sort of a valid source on things. And I, wanna, I hope that we continue to see that even more and that the average person is empowered to uh, hold power to account or you know, tell their own stories. So what I'm hearing from all of you is you see your job not just in getting information out to people, but bringing people into the entire Absolutely. process. Yeah. That's Absolutely. extraordinary. Yeah. All right. I am delighted. Thank you. I thank want to thank you, you all, yeah. not just for being here, but for the enormously important work uh, that you do. And I look forward to working with you in the months and years ahead. Thank you all very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, guys. Appreciate it.